Visitors. Do we have any first time? Yeah. Yeah. He wants to be quiet. Okay. We got a visitor back there who wants to be here. Praise the Lord. That's Amen. great. Okay. And, all right. We are so glad you're here today and trust this is going to be a great day in the Lord. We do have a wonderful lesson today. This is a lesson I would have loved, liked to teach last Sunday. But Tim kind, of, Tim kind of sneaked that other one in on me, so I had that one. <laughs> it's good. Listen. Uh, uh, I want you to bring, bring your attention to these invite cards for Easter. They're over on the table. You want to take one or two or three and give it to people in restaurants, in the neighborhood, wherever you can give it out and invite people for our Easter service, okay? Okay. Um, also, um, you know, our greeter, greeter ministry is an important ministry because I know when I come in on Sunday morning, it's really great to be greeted at the door with a smile and a handshake. And so um, we have a greeter ministry, and Jeff asked me to point out to you that on the board over here to my right is a list of the greeters from March. So if you have any questions, you just look up there and you get that information on the board, okay? Uh, and next week, I think Jeff and Julie is going to, will introduce all the greeters, okay? So that way we will know who they are. And we're very, very thankful for the ministry that you do. And uh, we are very thankful for that. Uh, also, if you have prayer requests, remember these slips here. They're back there on the table somewhere. And they're prayer requests. If you uh, fill that out and give that to uh, either Greg or Tim, uh, they will see that that gets put on our... Um, prayer request on your phone, okay, if you have a, one of them cell phones, and uh, that way next week, after you've forgotten everything, you can look there and you know who to pray for, okay, all right, and that's really, really important. Um, also, I'd like to bring your attention to this sheet here, you pick it up over in the lobby uh, before you go into church service. It has all the important information that you need uh, for information. What? They're right here in the back. Okay, we got them in the back. We got them in the back, back there. So just pick one up on your way out, and you get all the latest information that you need to know. Also, I have a little letter here. Reach up, reach in, reach, in, reach out from. This is from the. Uh, Chris Coulter, the pastor for students, and he writes to us, Dear Tim and class, thank you so much for your support of our students through your sponsorship of our golf tournament fundraiser. Your very generous donation will allow those uh, these students to attend student camp and mission trips with our student ministry, which will have an important impact in, on our future. Also, they have a deal if you have work to do around the house, uh, you can um, contact Chris and uh, arrange to have one of the st uh, students come over and do some work. Now, if you do that, <coughs> pay them well. I've had experience in this area. They're not to be taken advantage of. Okay, Just so you know. If you get them out there and you have them doing all kinds of work, and when they get ready, give them a little bite to eat, something to drink, and a nice gift for their trip. He's, you know, both my girls went to camps. When I was a student, and the church sent them to camps. I have never forgotten that. And it really, they both learned to swim and did all kinds of stuff. But anyway. That's real important that you do that. Okay, I think that's about all the ones I got. Okay, uh, Tim, 
Uh, do we have anybody who's ready to speak? Yeah. You want to introduce them? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Um, it's good to see everybody this morning. I have I have a special message for you this morning. We actually had a couple that was going to be introducing themselves this morning, but uh, they weren't able to, and so I decided to take the time and make a little special uh, message for you. I want to say it is good to see Kim here. Um, Kim said to me, uh, I'm church shopping. You don't mind me saying this, do you? Too late now. <laughs> he said, I'm church shopping, and this is my last stop. He's been looking at churches around town. Yes. And this is his last place. Yes. Now, folks, if we don't smother him before he gets <laughs> out, I'll pray that the fleas of a thousand camels will rest on you. Okay? I mean, Kim, we're glad that you're here. Hope that you enjoy our class. We know you're going to enjoy the church. He could have saved a lot of time stopped here first. <laughs> well, he's got something to compare us with, but anyway. Uh, many of you know uh, Keith, Keith Beecham. Do you know who I mean? Yes. Member of our Sunday school class? He's the one that comes with Tom Burke. Where is Tom? <clears throat> Tom, there you are. And he's been coming for about a year. And... Um, he let people know that uh, he has a favorite pet. His pet is a five foot long python snake. Uh, and anyway, I wanna I wanna read you something that I wrote yesterday, and it's um, it's called a a story about Keith. During the last twelve months, we've had almost all of our class members give a five minute introduction at the beginning of our Sunday school period. Keith Beecham was excited when I asked him to introduce himself two weeks ago on March the 3rd. But he was unable to because of sickness that day. Keith had a serious heart condition and he was supposed to have heart surgery two weeks ago, but he wasn't strong enough to risk the surgery. So he was transferred from the hospital to a hospice facility on Monday and he passed away on Thursday afternoon. He had absolutely no family. Now since he was scheduled to speak to you, I thought I would share some of what we learned about him since he had been coming to the friendship class. Keith was born in Pennsylvania and for 50 years he worked as a tool and die maker. He was a genius. He was able to produce anything for which he was given a blueprint. He made everything from all kinds of machinery parts to all kinds of guns and even made components that are used in pacemakers. After retiring, he moved to Ocala and he bought a house for himself and his pet of 45 years, a five foot python snake that he thought the world of. As the Lord would have it, he found himself as next door neighbor to Tom Burke. Amen. Now Tom would go out walking up and down the street from time to time, and so would Keith. And they would pass by each other. One day, Tom noticed Keith walking down the street with the python snake wrapped around him. <laughs> They became acquainted with each other, and Tom took the opportunity one day to invite him to come to our Sunday school class, Amen. to our Bible study. Keith said, yeah, I'll come. He came every single Sunday from that point until two weeks ago when he got sick. Now, it seemed that Keith hadn't made many friends in our area, and so he looked forward each week to seeing all the happy faces and meeting the joyful people in our class who he considered as his newfound friends. He also paid close attention to the Bible lessons. I watched him while I was teaching. And the gospel as it was presented, and it was our prayer that Keith would come to know the Lord as his Savior. 
<clears throat> now, on my first visit to Keith's home, I learned quite a bit about his background, his work, his hobbies, and so forth. In fact, I sat on the sofa right next to the glass aquarium where his python <laughs> was sleeping. I tried not to wake it up. <laughs> Keith's hobby was building rifles. And he had dozens of them hanging on all the living room walls. It was very interesting to be sure. He asked me if I had ever seen a Tommy gun. I told him no. So he went in the bedroom and he brought one out and he handed it to me. <laughs> I held it up confidently with my finger on the trigger. <laughs> and then I realized I didn't know if it was loaded or not. <laughs> he said he had over 300 guns in his house. Wow. Wow. I said it was time for me to leave. <laughs> on one occasion, Alec went with me to help make sure that Keith understood the plan of salvation. Keith was quite a talker. We spent 30, 45 minutes, and he would always change the subject. He said he was going to have heart surgery soon, but for us not to worry about him because it was a simple procedure and he wasn't worried about it at all. He said he outlived all his other fa family members, and he sure wasn't going to be any problem for him. Now, Tom's friendship and testimony over the months were certainly critical in drawing Keith's heart towards the Lord. Amen. Keith enjoyed being part of the small groups, which also influenced his attraction to spiritual things. I thank the Widdens, the Gaines, the Gaspersons, and others for loving Keith in their small groups. On Wednesday, Louise and I went to visit Keith at the hospice house in Summerfield. We could tell he was sedated, but was still alert enough to know who we were and to call us both by name. He actually said we were a cute couple. We haven't been told that for a while. I told him we were there because we loved him and that Jesus loved him as well. He acknowledged that and he indicated that he appreciated our concern for him. I shared the gospel in a clear, simple fashion and asked him if he'd like to know the Lord as his Savior. He said that I'm okay. When asked if there was anything we could do for him, he said, well, I have a pretty nice house and I'm a good cook. When I get better, I'd like to have some people over to talk about spiritual things while I cook them a meal. We told him that we were talking about spiritual things with him right now. He said, we are. <laughs> that same afternoon, Alec and Nancy joined Louise and I as we visited him for the third time. Along with other encouraging words, Alec read him John 3, 16 and put Keith's name in there. For God so loved Keith Amen. that he gave his only son for Keith. That if Keith would believe in him, Keith would not perish, but have everlasting life. He drifted in and out of consciousness, and while we sincerely believe he heard everything that was said, he still didn't have any response. That was twice on Wednesday. Thursday, Louise and I went back to visit him again. The next afternoon, it's 3 o'clock, and we continued to talk to him about the Lord. He was weaker than before, and communication was difficult. And I asked him if he was ready to meet the Lord. He said, ready. I asked him if he would repeat that. He clearly said two words. That's all I could get out of him. I believe. I believe. I told him we were claiming that as his profession of faith and would thank God for making him part of his family. Louise bent over and told him how happy she was that he trusted the Lord and that we were all going to be together in heaven with Jesus someday. 
When she said that, he turned his head, opened his eyes bright, wide, looked up to the ceiling and said one word with a renewed burst of energy. The one word was, wow. <laughs> Closed his eyes, turned his head. We kind of think that he got a glimpse of heaven. Because he passed away right after we left. The last words Keith heard on earth were Louise saying, we are all going to be together in heaven someday. And the first words he heard when he got to heaven, we believe, were from Jesus saying, welcome home. That's story of a class member yeah. that we as a class have ministered to and your friendship and your love and your prayers snatched a lonely guy out of the claws of Satan before it was too late. Amen. Now I don't know exactly the moment when he trusted Christ. I believe he did. He might have known the Lord all along, but just didn't share it with us. But I do believe at the end, we had a confirmation that he was ready to go. So I want to thank you all for being the kind of people you are and continue to challenge you to be friends with uh, anybody that comes into our class or that comes across your path. Uh, we should welcome them. So now continuing our study in the book of Genesis, we come to Genesis chapter 27, and the title of our lesson today is A Deceiver. A Deceiver. That doesn't sound good, but it's still a story, a lesson that we need to learn. Tim, and here's can the, I interrupt here's, a minute? I apologize, but um, um, Diana had to leave. Charles has just been taken to the emergency room. Oh. So we can just keep them in prayer. Okay. So she's going to call us later. Okay. Charles leave. Neville. Yeah. Neville. Going to the emergency room. Let's pray for him. Yeah. Lord, be with Charles right now as he gets care at the hospital. Help him, Lord, to know that we're praying for him and that you are looking out for him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God accomplishes his purposes through flawed families and people. If you think that you have to be perfect in order for God to use you, forget it. God uses broken people, flawed people, to do his will. And so uh, we notice that in Biographies, authors sometimes ignore or cover up the character flaws and mistakes of their famous subjects. In contrast, the writers of the scriptures present humans with their warts and all, teaching that God can work through all kinds of people as long as they're willing to submit to him. So God can use us. Now there's a story about the first mate of a ship who despised the captain. In the ship's log, he wrote these words. The captain was sober today when he was on the bridge. <laughs> now, the truth of the matter was that the captain was sober every day when he was on the bridge. The words that were written were truthful, but the message was deceitful. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, it's sort of like trying to make someone believe something is true and it's not. Here's a perfect example. You get up on Sunday morning and everything about you hurts. And you come in and somebody says, how are you doing, John? And he says, fine. He's deceitful. He's not telling the truth. Well, we all do that, don't we? Because we don't want to have to take time to explain to everybody about all of our aches and pains. That's deceitful. I heard a little uh, poem one time, a lightning bug has a light, but he doesn't have a mind. He goes steaming through the darkness with his headlight on behind. <laughs> a lightning bug is actually, is actually a firefly. Fireflies have these lights and they flash 
and they the flashes mean something. And so a male firefly flashes a certain signal to female fireflies so that they would be attracted. So you can flash certain lights and the female and the male gets attracted to that female. But some females, fireflies, they learn to flash false signals. <laughs> and it gets the male to come towards them, and then they attack them and eat them. Folks, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make that up, okay? I just heard that. That's an example of deception. Somebody once said, Answer me yes or no. Have you stopped stealing from your boss? <laughs> Doesn't matter how you answer, it's gonna be a deceptive answer. Or have you stopped beating your wife? I mean, I don't like to use that one, okay? Because, um, you know, because those are questions that create false answers. So do we, we understand what deception is, right? Okay. Well, now Jacob is a great illustration from the pages of the Old Testament. And his very name means deceiver. That's the, that's the, per, that's the definition of his name, deceiver. And boy, did he live up to his name. <clears throat> but God accomplished his purposes through Jacob as Jacob learned to yield to him. Now, this little story about Jacob has got a, has got a good ending, <clears throat> but it's kind of <clears throat> dirty going through it. And uh, when I look back on my own life, I see how I have failed the Lord at times, and I'm amazed that God could use me despite my shortcomings. Now, you learned about Jacob's marriage to Rebekah last week. So after 20 years of marriage, I mean, Isaac's marriage, after 20 years of marriage, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, was unable to have children. And so he prayed for her. Guess what? She became pregnant. And the scripture says she had a very active pregnancy. That meant there was motion going on inside, I guess. And God told her that there were two nations in her womb. She was going to have twins. One baby would be stronger than the other, and the older one would serve the younger. And here we have Jacob and Esau. Esau came out first. The conflict between these two brothers began right there at the birth. The conflict began at birth. Esau came out first. And Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel as he came out of the mother. And so uh, in ancient cultures, being labeled a heel catcher was dishonorable. And it gave the idea of a trickster or a deceiver or a scoundrel. Jacob got that name. He held on to Esau's heel and he was named deceiver. Now, today's lesson highlights the next major conflict demonstrating Jacob's deception. Uh, before this one, there was this incident where uh, Esau was out in the field and Jacob was home. And one day Jacob got Esau, the older brother, to sell him his birthright for a bowl of stew. You remember the story? And what is the birthright? The birthright is a double portion of the inheritance of the father. And Jacob wanted the double portion, but it belonged, actually belonged to the older. But Jacob found a way where he could get it. He sold him this, this pot of stew. But today's lesson is now about the next conflict that they had. The next major conflict, which demonstrated Jacob's deception, and it involved stealing his father's blessing that was designated for Esau. So Isaac is now old, he's nearly blind, and Esau, uh, Isaac told Esau, I want you to go out and hunt and get some wild game and bring it in and cook it for me and bring me a meal so that I can bless you. 
He was a real outdoorsman. However, Rebecca, the mother, she was not very smart, and she poured out her love on Jacob, the younger one. And Jacob was her favorite son. And so she connived a plan for this favorite son to steal the blessing from Esau. So while Esau was out hunting, deer hunting, I suppose, looking for some wild game, Rebecca made uh, preparations, and with the preparations and a disguise in place, Jacob went into his father. And that brings us to this trap set. Verse 18 and 19 of chapter 27. Here's what the scripture says. When he came to his father, he said, My father. And he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob replied to his father. I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. Well, this is pretty blatant deception. Isaac's eyes were blind. He couldn't tell which of his sons were standing in front of him. So Jacob right here violated two of the commands that were later given to Moses. One was lying. The other was dishonoring his father. In fact, he lied three times right here. He said, I'm Esau, your firstborn. That's deception. I did what your mother, I did what your, what, uh, what you told me to do. He didn't do what his father told him. He did what his mother told him to do. And he didn't get an animal from the field. He got an animal from the fold. So he lied three times to his father right there. See, Rebecca prepared two goats. She was determined that her favorite son would receive the blessing regardless of the cost. So Jacob says to, um, so Isaac said to Jacob, sit up. That proves that he was bedridden, okay? Sit up and eat. There was some urgency that Jacob put into him. Why was he in such a hurry? Probably because he was afraid he was going to get found out pretty soon. Uh, or he, he was maybe worried Esau was going to return. And he wanted the blessing and he wanted it now. Now, a birthright is related to the possessions of the father. The birthright is double portion of the possessions. The blessing was for the authority and leadership of that family to the next generation. So the blessing was really the important thing. Where God, when the father would say to the oldest son, I'm giving you my blessing. The birthright was supposed to go with it. I'm giving you my blessing because I'm counting on you to lead this family into the next generation and provide that godly leadership. So passing the blessing could be at a ceremony with a celebratory meal and everybody dressed in their finest clothes, or it could be a deathbed declaration. And Isaac believed that he was near death, and so this was a deathbed declaration. Verse 20, it says, But Isaac said to his son, how did you ever find it so quickly, my son? Here's what Jacob answered. Uh, because the Lord your God made it happen to me. Mm, it wasn't going as planned. I think you can understand that. Isaac was suspicious. Jacob violated another commandment. He implied that God had directed him. He says, your God, not my God bringing God into Jacob's deception bordered on blasphemy. Blasphemy is a lack of reverence for somebody in authority. Lack of reverence for God. <clears throat> blasphemy, lack of reverence. It's like Peter around the fire that night when the, when the servant girl said, weren't you part of his group? And Peter says, I don't even know him. Three times he denied Jesus. That's blasphemy. And, and that's exactly what happened here. So take that piece of paper you got. Let's fill out a few of these lines. The first one will help us to understand where we are right here. Telling lies. 
can easily lead to blasphemy. Telling lies can easily lead to blasphemy. So we know where we are. Now we look at this deception being carried out. Now the physical features and mannerisms of his sons were seared into Isaac's memory. He knew, he knew what Esau was like. He knew what Jacob was like. He knew what they looked like. He knew how they talked. But his, his eyesight was gone at this point. But his other senses were still strong and his suspicion was growing. I think yours would be too. Verse 21, then Isaac said to Jacob, uh, please come closer so I can touch you, my son. Are you really my son Esau or not? <clears throat> now Jacob accepted the title, my son, deceitfully because <clears throat> Isaac said, are you really my son? Well, and if you say, yeah, I'm your son, that's deceitful. You're not the son that he was talking about. <clears throat> Jacob was nervous, and he over-answered. I'm your son. I'm your firstborn. I'm, I, I did what you said to do. He talked too much. He claimed that he had obeyed. I've done what you told me. Isaac was still not convinced. He asked him again. Are you really my son Esau or not? The second time he asked him, he says, come closer. <laughs> the word is nagash, N-A-G-A-S, and it means to approach. <clears throat> this word is used repeatedly with an increasing sense of tension and dread as this story goes on. Jacob was staying distant. He was afraid that he was going to be found out. And so, <clears throat> verse 22 and 23 says, So Jacob came closer to his father Isaac. And when he touched him, he said, hmm, This is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Now, he didn't recognize him because his hands were hairy, like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Now, here's what Rebekah had done. She dressed Jacob in Esau's finest clothes and she put young goat skins on his hands and neck so he would appear to be Esau she forgot to tell Jacob to disguise his voice so that he would sound like Esau so Jacob wasn't a very good impersonator you know what an impersonator is somebody who sounds like somebody else I used to, I used to hear people impersonate John Kennedy by saying, "Ask not what you can do for your country, but ask what you your country can do for you," or the other way around, whatever it is. <laughs> You've heard people impersonate uh, Bush. You've heard people impersonate Clinton. You've heard people impersonate Trump. However, the hairy hands of Jacob. convinced him that he was talking to Esau. So he blessed him. Well, he actually started the blessing. You see, it was a process. A blessing included eating a meal. He hadn't done that. It included kissing the son. He hadn't done that. It included final, finally verbally blessing him. If Jacob's hands were smooth, the blessing would have stopped right there. But Isaac was being deceived by his son. Verse 24, again he asked, are you really my son? This is after he felt his hands. Are you really my son Esau? <coughs> Jacob replied again, I am. Whoa. He's in for some trouble. If your child lied to you over and over again like that. The punishment would be getting bigger, you know, more and more severe as time went on. Right, John? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so he asked him again. And he lied again. Here's the next line on your paper. Regularly telling lies usually requires the telling of more lies. 
regularly telling lies usually requires the telling of more lies. Still perplexed, Isaac asks for the third time, are you really my son? Jacob answers, I am. That's all he said this time, I am. In fact, I am is really one word, A-N-I in Hebrew, Ani. That's all he said, Ani, means I am. Now Jacob is afraid that his voice is going to give him away, so he's not going to talk anymore. He keeps his talking to a minimum. He still intended to deceive his father. You know what? This is the last recorded word that Jacob said to his father in this whole interaction. He just didn't talk anymore. He didn't want to get caught, but he realized that he was he was in a trap. <coughs> Verse 25, then he said, this is Isaac talking, then he said, bring it closer to me, the meal, and let me eat some of my son's game so that I can bless you. So Jacob brought it closer to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. So the crucial moment had now arrived. The tension was increased. <laughs> When Isaac said, bring the tray closer to me so I can eat. He said, my son, my, my, I want to eat some of my son's game. The word is T-S-A-Y-A-D. I don't know how to pronounce it. Sayed. It is actually means food that is hunted or caught like venison. He was expecting wild game. But he got goat meat that Rebecca had cooked. Maybe the wine dulled his senses so he couldn't tell the difference. But we don't know. Jacob, the trickster, the deceiver, the scoundrel, was living up to his name. Here's the next line on your paper. The fear of getting caught should be a warning to do what's right. If you're afraid you're going to get caught, that should be a warning to you to do what's right, not what's wrong. Verse 26 and 7 says, Then his father Isaac said to him, Oh boy, please come closer and kiss me, my son. <coughs> so he came closer and kissed him. When Isaac smelled the clothes that he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. Now, was, was the kiss a normal part of the ritual and, or ceremony? Or was it an expression of father-son affection? Maybe it was the final test that Isaac put to prove that he was not being deceived. If, if my son could just kiss me, I think I could... Make sure it was him. Isaac was not fully convinced by the words, the food, the hairy hands, the rough skin neck, or giving credit to God. But the smell of clothes convinced him. <clears throat> he said it's like a smell of a field. The word is S-A-D-E-H, Seda. It refers to lands where <coughs> wild animals are found. His nose convinced him of what his eyes, his ears, and his fingers could not. He may have had a, a condition that's called hyperosmia. Have you ever heard of it? Hyperosmia is a medical condition that is actually an overwhelming sensitivity to smells. Have you ever known anybody like that that had an overwhelming sensitivity to smells? <coughs> I have a brother-in-law who is, who is deathly uh, affected by the smell of peanuts. If he smells peanuts in any way, shape, or form, he goes into convulsions and they say it'll kill him. It's, a, it's an allergy that, that's deadly. My wife has hyperosmia. She has a, an exceptionally overwhelming sensitivity to the smell of orris root. Do you know what that is? No. Orris root is the, is the part of a flower 
that holds the fragrance of the flower. Am I correct, honey? So orris root is in many flowers. <coughs> many flowers don't have orris root, but there are some where the sensitivity of the orris root causes her to close up and she stops breathing. Well, that doesn't work for very long, okay? So when she smells one of these flowers, she has to leave the room immediately. And some of the flowers that are worst are like gardenia and any others that come to your mind? Oh, the more fragrant ones. All of the more fragrant flowers. When you walk into a floral shop, when you smell flowers, you smell the more fragrant ones. They have orris root. She can't go in there. She can't. Uh, same thing with uh, some perfume. Same thing, okay? So, I don't know. Maybe maybe Isaac had hyperosmia. <laughs> a very strong, overwhelming, sensitive smell. Well, anyway, he smelled Esau, and that's what convinced him that Esau was the one that was there. <clears throat> and so, that brings us to the next part, which says, blessing is granted. Here's the blessing. Isaac says to Jacob, he thinks he's talking to Esau, may God give to you from the dew of the sky, from the richness of the land, an abundance of grain and new wine. May peoples serve you and nations bow in homage to you. Be master over your relatives. May your mother's sons bow in homage to you. Those who curse you will be cursed and those who bless you will be blessed. There's the blessing. It's a fourfold blessing. Number one, it's blessing for agricultural success. You see, having productive harvests and herds was an ever-present concern for people back then. God had blessed Isaac with an abundance of both. But when he says the dew of the sky, it's because rain, it only rained twice a year there. So the dew was very, very important for the watering of the plants uh, and the richness of the land. Uh, that means heaven and earth. He's saying, I'm, I'm blessing you with everything that heaven and earth has to offer. Speaks of nature's uh, bounty. He said, may God give this to you. Well, this speaks of God's divine supremacy over all other gods. The Canaanite gods, Dagon and Tirosh, they were thought to provide fertility and to provide abundance, but they didn't do that. Isaac says to Jacob, may God grant you this. Second thing. Part of the blessing was for success and respect internationally. He said nations would bow down to him. That means they would be in subservience and obedience and honor. He's talking about the Canaanites and the Philistines and the Moabites and the Syrians and the Ammonites and the Edomites. All of these nations bowed down to Jacob and his descendants. It was most prominent during the days of David and Solomon when they were kings. In fact, Revelation 11:15 says the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. The descendant of Jacob will reign forever and ever over all the kingdoms of the world. Then he says, I'm giving you authority over your relatives. The word is A-C-H. It means brothers. <coughs> now, there's no mention of Rebekah having any more sons. So this most likely refers to Esau. Our Revelation 17, 14 says, They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. <clears throat> Jacob's descendant will be the over all people in the end. Then the last part had to do with blessings and curses on those who blessed and cursed his son. The New Testament teaches us that this part of God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled in Christ. Genesis teaches us that other people are the conduits of God's blessings and to be cursed meant to be detested. And so Isaac was faithful to speak God's blessing to Jacob. He was supposed to do that and he did it. The last line on your paper. Parents should pray for and speak blessings over their children. What's the line above? <clears throat> the line above that is God uses every situation to accomplish his perfect will. Jacob was wrong to deceive his father, but God knew what he was doing. And God uses every situation to accomplish 
his perfect will. So what are the consequences of Jacob's de deception, his deceit? You know, it costs you something when you, when you lie and you deceive people. Well, here's a few of the consequences. Number one, he never, ever saw his mother again. Number two, his brother wanted to kill him. Number three, he was deceived by his uncle Laban. You remember the story? Esau became the founder of an enemy nation. His family became torn by strife. He was exiled from his family for years. How different his life would have been if he and his mother just waited for God's timing. But no, they didn't. They went into this deception. The last verse, 30. As soon as Isaac, oh, I like this one. <clears throat> as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had left the presence of his father Isaac, oh, his brother Esau arrived <laughs> from his hunting. Uh-oh. <laughs> See, Jacob didn't stick around. The Hebrew text reads, going out, he went out. <clears throat> that means that he scarcely had left his father's presence. Verse 41 says that Esau wanted to kill him. Esau was completely unaware of what had anything that had happened since he left home that morning. He was going out to shoot a deer and fix a meal and get a blessing, like his dad said. <clears throat> Isaac had promised his blessing <coughs> to the firstborn, but he couldn't give it to him because it wasn't God's will. Now, Jacob was wrong to deceive his aged blind father but God still used that situation for his plans and purposes the pattern is repeated a generation later in Joseph when Joseph was sold into slavery but God used that for good you know the story so here's the message here's the lesson God uses flawed people to accomplish his plan. Amen. He can use me. I'm flawed. He can use you. Your flaw. <clears throat> if we'll let him do that. You know this song. <clears throat> Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. We yield our will to him. He can use us regardless of any flaws that we might have. So let's pray and commit the rest of the day to the Lord. And... Um, and uh, trust him for the future. Now, next week is the week before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Easter, I'm sorry. In the, in the lobby of the church, there's, there's little packets of Easter cards. I wish you would pick up a little packet, give them out, invite people to church, invite them to come to Sunday school. You see, see anybody in church over there that's about our age, ask them if they're going to Bible study anywhere. And uh, we'll have more people coming. We're going to decorate, put up a little decorations in here for Easter. We're going to have something special for Easter in here. I can't tell you about it right now. I might tell you about it next week. But uh, we're going to do something uh, a little different for Easter this year. Uh, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. No, not right. <laughs> Just joking. On that, okay? Rabbits and eggs. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the lesson of Jacob and Esau and Isaac and Rebecca. And Lord, it's a sad story to really to think of how <clears throat> how wicked and deceptive we can be. But but the lesson we learn is that you can take us. And you can use us if we'll just change, repent, change our heart, and follow you. And we'll be learning more about how this happened to Jacob in the days ahead. But 
Help us to love you more, to witness to the lost, to invite people to come to Sunday school and to church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be dismissed. Small group leaders, make sure your groups come to Sunday school next week. I don't wear a bow tie. Well, he said that Tuesday at school, he's a bow tie and so he's got his bow tie. He's got his bow tie. It's hard times. Yeah. 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 Yeah.